And welcome back, everybody. Shy Sox fan 11 and Geriatric Gaming here with another basic beginner's guide. And today we'll be taking a look at the Wraith. We had already done a basic beginner's guide to the pig. If you haven't seen that yet, check out the card up in the upper right screen for that particular guide. The Wraith has been a killer that a lot of people have requested that I take a look at and do a guide for. I don't profess to be a Wraith expert by any means, but if you've never played Wraith before, then this hopefully will give you a basic idea of how to play him, some strategies, and some basic explanations of how his power works and his add-ons, and will hopefully give you a head start to being able to play successfully as the Wraith. And the Wraith is actually a killer that the developers buffed not that long ago. Originally, he was considered to be one of the weaker killers on the roster. Uh, he's not one of the strongest. He's definitely not like a Blight or a Nurse, but... He absolutely can be played even at higher levels of play if you know how to play him. Again, I'm not going to profess to be an expert, but I will hopefully be able to impart a few things and some knowledge about how he plays that will hopefully help you to be able to play the race successfully in your matches. So let's go ahead and take a look right off the bat at some immediate information. The Wraith is Philip Ajomo. He has a really good backstory if you want to check that out sometime. As far as the killers go, he's actually one of the more sympathetic ones. What about his powers and his base stats? Well, let's take a look at those. The Wraith moves whenever he is not cloaked, when he's moving normally at 4.6 meters per second. That's going to be pretty standard for killers that are not ranged killers, like let's say a Huntress or a Trickster. Uh, 4.6 meters per second is a base killer speed movement, and the Wraith has that when he is not cloaked. The Wraith also has a 32 meter terror radius as his base, again, when he is not cloaked. Once more, that is pretty much a base terror radius for almost every killer in the game. And finally, the Wraith is a very tall killer. What does this mean? Well, it basically means that if you're trying to do mind games on loops that are shorter, like let's say the, the loops that are on a lot of the auto maps, you're not really gonna be able to hide yourself. You're going to be able to see the Wraith when he's uncloaked pretty well. He's not the tallest killer. I think that probably uh, honor probably goes to the plague. But he's not going to be a smaller killer, so you're not going to be able to really hide him whenever he's not cloaked. But then again, you're going to want to be cloaked during a lot of your gameplay. That's his main power. And that's what we're going to take a look at now. The Wailing Bell is the Wraith's power. Every match that you play as the Wraith, you will start out already cloaked. During the course of the match, you're going to hold your power button to cloak, and you're going to use your power button to uncloak. Whenever you are cloaked, that will give you the the um, that will give you the status of undetectable. And the only thing that will counter this is going to be spine chill. Whenever you're undetectable, you will have a zero terror radius. You will also have no red stain. The only thing again that's really going to detect you when you're undetectable is going to be spine chill. And if you've ever run Spine Chill before, that's not always going to be 100% reliable. You can defeat Spine Chill either by looking away from wherever you're headed for. If you suspect a survivor that you're headed for has Spine Chill, look in a different direction as you move towards them. That'll defeat Spine Chill. And even if you're not doing that, a survivor isn't necessarily going to know what direction you're coming from. And that is part of what makes the Wraith's power very good, is using that confusion. And we'll look at that a little bit later on during this guide when we illustrate some stuff with our friend Jeff who's joining us for this round. So when the Wraith is cloaked he will be completely invisible from 20 meters and further away. In other words the Wraith is moving towards a survivor until they get within 20 meters the survivor is not going to be able to see you whenever you're cloaked. Whenever you get within 20 meters, the Wraith is going to see you shimmer if they're paying attention, but you will still be invisible. But that shimmer does show up. So if a survivor is paying attention, when you start to approach them, they will be able to see you shimmering even in your invisibility state. You do get total invisibility whenever you do stand still, however. So if you happen to be in an area and you're not moving, you will be completely invisible even to survivors that are within that 20 meter radius unless you start moving again. Now, whenever you are cloaked, you can interact with objects. You can kick generators. You can break breakable walls. You can break pallets. The one thing you cannot do when you are cloaked 
is you cannot attack survivors. You will have to uncloak in order to attack. Things when you are cloaked that can affect you, however, also, flashlights, firecrackers, flash grenades, all of these can stun you whenever you're cloaked and force you to uncloak. That's, uh, I believe that's light burn is what they call that. Uh, the Wraith is one of the only characters that this affects in this fashion. So if you're playing Wraith and you play against the lobby with a lot of flashlights, survivors, really good survivors who know how to use a flashlight know this and are going to attempt to burn you. And if they do that, you will suffer a four second stun. So you want to try to avoid that if at all possible. And one other thing to remember is that even when you are cloaked, you are going to still be making noises. The Wraith has a very distinctive growling type noise that indicates his presence. So again, even though you're invisible, very, very astute survivors who are paying attention to their surroundings will know you're coming. There are things you can do that can kind of hide that, and we will talk about that when we get into our demonstration a little bit later on. But remember, within 20 meters, you'll still be able to be seen with your, with your invisibility sheen and you will still be making noises. So you're going to have to work around that as you attempt to ambush survivors. As you start the match, again, as I said, you will start the match cloaked. Once you uncloak, whenever you cloak again, it takes one and a half seconds. Again, this is all times that are based without add-ons. Your wailing bell will sound as you cloak and you have no speed penalty. So you're moving at 4.6 meters per second as you cloak you do not suffer a speed penalty to recloak back up. Your wailing bell, again, without add-ons, can be heard up to 24 meters away, and there's a distinct whooshing sound that you will hear up to 40 meters away whenever the wraith is cloaking. In order to uncloak, whenever you hit your power button, it will take, again, without any add-ons, three seconds. Your bell will ring halfway through, one and a half seconds in, and during your uncloak, your movement speed is actually going to be reduced to 1.6 meters per second during that action of uncloaking. Once you've uncloaked, you will get a one second lunge speed and your default lunge speed is 6.9 meters per second for that time after you've uncloaked. So that lunge, again, very important as you're uncloaking and trying to get hits on survivors, that will give you a little bit of extra oomph in order to hit somebody and that can be very useful if you're trying to get somebody who might be camping a pallet, and we'll take a look at that a little bit later on, or just in general, because once you ring that bell, again, survivors are going to know that there's a wraith in the match that's close to them that's uncloaking. They're almost always going to start running, moving to a safer area of the map, moving to a pallet, moving to a window, and that lunge will be important in order for you to try to land that first hit or that second hit to get somebody down. Using that lunge and using your positioning on the map to try to survive sur surprise survivors is going to be very key to playing Wraith successfully. You would think that as an invisible killer, it would be very easy for you to just land hits left and right on random survivors. You'll be able to get away with that against very new survivors, but again, people who've played the game as survivor for any length of time eventually will learn how to counter the Wraith, and you will have to use some strategy as far as how to approach people, how to position yourself, and how to take advantage of your lunge and to take advantage of some of the add-ons that you're able to use. Now, let's take a look at the race basic perks. His first one is Predator. Whenever you have Predator in play, scratch marks left by survivors will spawn slightly closer together. Uh, this is a terrible perk. It's arguably one of the worst perks in the game. Survivors leave scratch marks, and when they run, they leave scratch marks on lots of different things. Not only on the ground, they'll leave them on pallets, they'll leave them on walls, they leave them on lots of other environmental objects. Whenever you run Predator, it tends to eliminate that, as I've moved to the trapper accidentally. Pardon me for that. Back to the raid. Um, again, uh, Predator will make those scratch marks spawn closer together, it actually makes it more difficult to track in my in my own practice. And Predator just honestly is a perk that unless you're trying to get an adept wraith, it's not a perk you want to run. Again, it's arguably one of the worst perks in the game. His second teachable perk, available at level 35, is going to be Bloodhound. Whenever you're running Bloodhound, 
uh, fresh blood marks are going to be more discernible than normal, and they can be tracked longer than normal. Uh, Bloodhound is a kind of a mediocre perk, but it's it's certainly not the worst perk in the game. If you have trouble tracking, blood is a very good way to track. It's more reliable than scratch marks are, and Bloodhound absolutely makes blood much, much brighter whenever you are tracking somebody. Uh, I've done Adept Wraith, I've played with Bloodhound, and it definitely helped. Uh, again, would I recommend running this perk? Not really, uh, once you start to get good at the game and tracking scratch marks. I'm not particularly great at tracking scratch marks, and I don't run Bloodhound, because there's just better perks. But again, that's what it does. And finally, the race last perk at level 40 is Shadowborn, which gives you a wider field of view whenever you play this. And this is a great perk if you're playing Nurse. If you're not playing Nurse, almost every other killer does not really benefit from this. It, it's pretty much, again, a, a useless perk. Uh, the main thing I can say about it is it gives you a, a feel that you're moving faster than you actually are when you're running it because of the wider field of view. But honestly, again, unless you're playing for an Adept Wraith, it's not really a perk you're going to want to run. It's just not very good unless again you're playing on nurse very very high numbers of players not all nurse players but many nurse players run this perk i run it when i play nurse but on wraith again not really a particularly good perk on him or most of the killer roster so if you're not running these perks and playing wraith what are you going to run well let's take a look really quick i'll show you the build i use and we'll talk about other builds other strategies when it comes to your perk loadout so, my basic Wraith build is going to be as follows. We will run Corrupt Intervention. That's a Plague perk. Corrupt Intervention has the three generators the furthest away from you blocked by the entity for the first two minutes of the trial at Tier 3. It's a very effective, very, very effective slowdown perk at the beginning of the game when you really need as killer to start getting pressure on. It stops generators from popping initially right away in the match. And it gives you an opportunity to, to at least start to get into some chases and maybe hopefully get a couple downs before Corrupt wears off. I never used to be a huge proponent of Corrupt, but now that Boon Totems are part of the meta, uh, Ruin and Undying, the Hex perk slowdowns that are in the game, just really are no longer anywhere near as viable as they were before. Uh, people are absolutely cleansing totems and booning totems at a rate that they probably never have before. <clears throat> so if you're playing as Wraith, I'd strongly recommend Corrupt as an early game slowdown perk. Our second perk slot has actually changed. It used to be Pop Goes the Weasel. And if you're not familiar with Pop, we will take a look at Pop really quick. Uh, Pop Goes the Weasel is a clown perk. Whenever you kick a generator after you've hooked somebody at tier three, the generator you kick will lose 25% of its progress and start to regress. This is what we used to run on Wraith. Now we run the new artist perk, Scourge Hook Pain Resonance. Now, when you run this perk, you have four random hooks in the trial, will be Scourge Hooks. You'll see their auras in white. Whenever you hook somebody on a Scourge Hook, the generator with the most progress will explode, making it lose 15% progress at tier three. It will start to regress, and anyone repairing that generator will scream, revealing their location. This, to me, is now preferable than pop. Even though the regression that you get is 10% less, it will be on the generator that most needs the regression. And the additional information of letting you know if a survivor is actually there is just, is just outstanding. And the only thing that really kind of screws you over with this perk is potentially RNG putting the hooks all together on the same side of the map. Maybe not where you're chasing. Maybe you down somebody and a Scourge Hook isn't close enough for you to reach. I've been running Scourge Hook on almost all of my killer builds of late. And what I've found is that I usually have no trouble getting value out of Scourge Hook over the course of a match, even with there only being four, even with the random location of them. And I certainly would recommend it on Wraith. Again, just for the fact that it's going to regress the generator that you really need to regress the most. And that additional information of letting you know where those survivors are at if they're on the gen, also very, very useful. Now, this is where other builds can start to vary. Again, we're looking at my build first, and then we'll talk about some other perks that you could run in their place. 
I run Make Your Choice, which is a really, really good perk on a killer like the Wraith that has so much mobility. Make Your Choice is a pig perk. At Tier 3, whenever a survivor rescues someone else from a hook and you're 32 meters or further away, Make Your Choice will make that survivor scream and will make them exposed for 60 seconds. You also have a cooldown of 60 seconds on this perk. So basically, you hook somebody, you leave the hook, you get more than 32 meters away, somebody full health rescues them, you head back to the hook, you go after the person who's made the rescue because you obviously are not going to want to tunnel the person off the hook, and they are going to be one shot down. And that allows you to get downs quickly. It gives the Wraith some lethality that he really doesn't have otherwise. And particularly in this current meta of boon perks where if you play hit and run tactics, it's very easy for survivors to just run to a boon totem and heal up quickly. Uh, make your choice eliminates the need for that. Perfectly healthy survivors are immediately dropped when you run this perk. And again, it works really well on a killer like the Wraith that can traverse the map very, very quickly. As long as you're not in a, a chase already with somebody that's injured and you're not already giving up another down, if you're just randomly moving around the map and you hear make your choice go off, you can immediately head back to the hook and you'll have a fresh, healthy target, hopefully, that you can chase down and continue to put pressure on the team you're facing. How will you know where to go when you're wraith when you get a hook? I run barbecue and chili. Not only is this obviously great for blood points, Every survivor you hook at Tier 3, you get a 25% stackable bonus for your blood point gains after the trial, all the way up to 100%. But it will show you survivor auras for 4 seconds if they are 40 meters or further away from a hook. Now, barbecue isn't quite as good as it used to be. Again, if survivors are running the boon perk of Shadow Step, auras are going to be hidden. And of course, survivors can always jump into lockers if they suspect you have barbecue and chili. But you almost always, when you get a hook, see somebody's aura, and that'll give you somebody else to chase. And ideally, as you're playing this build and this strategy, the idea <clears throat> is to get the ball rolling quickly, get somebody a on a hook, use barbecue to find a new target, go after them, and hopefully be downing them just as the first person you've downed gets unhooked and somebody's exposed, and then it's basically rinse and repeat back and forth throughout the match and that should be enough pressure to keep people off of generators and of course along with the score chuck even generators that they are working on are going to start regressing and i've i've run this build or when i had pop in place the score chuck i've run this build with a great success even up against red rank survive with friend groups and it's been very effective uh, is it going to be a winner all the time no but it's definitely a build i would recommend as a way for you to be able to get I think successful matches as the Wraith. Now, what else could you run? Uh, there are other perks that work out pretty well as far as the race play style goes. Uh, instead of make your choice, if we're talking about getting away from the hook, you could always run uh, Hex Devour Hope. Uh, Devour Hope, every time you are 24 meters away, Devour Hope gets a token when someone gets rescued. You get two tokens, you get a little bit quicker after somebody's uh, hooked. You get the three tokens and everybody in the match is gonna be suffering from the exposed status effect. Five tokens, you can actually start mooring people. Uh, the only problem with Devour Hope and the reason I run Make Your Choice above it is because obviously Devour Hope is a hex. Totems have terrible location spawns almost always. And in the current boon meta, Survivors are looking for totems more than they ever have before, but if you feel a little bit spicy and you want to have a way to not only get one-shot downs, but to get people out of a match quickly, again, the Wraith can get that 24 meters away very easily and then can get back to unhooks very quickly. Uh, you could even run Devour and make your choice together, putting Devour in place of barbecue and chili. If, again, if you really wanted to be a little bit spicy, and at some point go from one shot downs on certain people to one shot downs on everybody. But Devour, again, a very good perk to run on Wraith and it's one that can definitely surprise your survivors when they find out you have it. Uh, you could try other builds. We have tried an all hex build. We've run a build of Hex Ruin, which of course regresses generators at 200% whenever a survivor lets go of a generator and it's not being repaired. We have paired that up with 
detects undying. Whenever undying is active, you'll see survivors that are close to dull totems. Whenever another hex totem is cleansed, that will transfer to undying, basically meaning that it's undying that they've gotten rid of. It's a way to protect your ruin. We've run those two along with uh, the new perk from the artist, Hex Pentimento. Oh, let me move around here. Uh, Hex Pentimento. Uh, Hex Pentimento, which again is the new artist perk. There it is. Whenever a survivor cleanses a totem, not blesses it, but cleanses it, you'll see that aura. You can then start rekindling those totems, as you can see. Rekindling one will decrease the survivor's repair speed by 30%. Two will also decrease their healing speed by that amount. Three decreases their recovery speed. Four decreases the exit gate opening. And if somehow or another you can get five of these relit, then all the totems are blocked by the entity and all of these debuffs for survivors will stay in effect. And we've been running as our last hex perk either Haunted Ground which will spawn two totems at the start of the trial. If one of those is cleansed, everyone will suffer from the exposed effect for 60 seconds. Or we've been running it with Hex Plaything. Hex Plaything, um, Haunted Ground, of course, a spirit perk. Plaything is a pinhead perk. Whenever you hook a survivor, they become cursed. Hex Plaything will activate on a dull totem, and that survivor will suffer from the oblivious status until that totem is cleansed. For the first 90 seconds, only the person whose totem that belongs to can cleanse it, and they can only see it when they're within 16 meters of it. Will they be able to see its aura? Uh, Plaything pairs up very nicely with Pentimento, and Plaything is actually, I think, a pretty underrated perk on a lot of killers. We run it on our pig build now, and it seems kind of counterintuitive to run it with the Wraith, since he's undetectable most of the time anyway if you're playing him correctly. But that being said, if you want to play a fun build, that all hex build can be a lot of fun. Not only trying to get it to five stacks of Pentimento, but it can be a powerful perk because as Wraith, you can actually push people off of gens and make Ruin somewhat effective. So now that we've talked about perks, other perks that you could run on Wraith, all depend on your play style. And again, these are perks I would probably run in lieu of Make Your Choice in Barbecue. Uh, Sloppy Butcher is a very good perk, though, again, in the current Boon meta, maybe not as good as it once was. Uh, Sloppy Butcher means that any time you hit somebody with a basic attack, they will get the Mangled and Hemorrhage status, which means they're going to bleed more, and it's going to take them much longer to heal. A very popular style to play with the Wraith was what was called a hit-and-run strategy. You would cloak, you would find a survivor, you would uncloak, you would smack them. Then you'd cloak back up and look for a different survivor and try to injure as many people as possible and then sneak up on them when they were healing. A lot of the race that would run sloppy <coughs> would also run a nurse's calling, which means anybody that's being healed or is healing within 28 meters, you'll be able to see their aura. Again, that used to be two perks that you would see on a lot of hit and run race. During the current meta, again, of boon perks and the circle of healing in particular, hit and run is nowhere near as successful as it used to be. That being said, again, it's something you could still run. Uh, brutal Strength is not a terrible perk to run. As a Wraith, you're going to be seeing a lot of pallet drops. Uh, this allows you to break pallets, breakable walls, and gens 20% faster. So this is a perk that I could say you could run in place of, let's say, like I said, maybe make your choice or barbecue. Uh, another perk, and again, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this because I don't run the perk, but uh, again, as a Wraith, you're not one of the strongest killers. Uh, a lot of Wraiths run Noed. Uh, Noed means whenever the last generator is popped, all the survivors are going to be exposed and one shot down. Your movement speed when you're uncloaked would be increased by 4% as long as the totem is still up. Again, I don't run this but uh, a lot of Wraiths do because, again, Wraith, not the strongest killer in the world. A lot of matches make it to endgame. So Noed is definitely a perk that could be useful to you. Uh, another perk maybe uh, you could run would be the, the perk from, if we can find it here. Uh, there it is. Uh, Lethal Pursuer from Nemesis. At the start of the trial, you'll see auras of all survivors for nine seconds as a Wraith. You can get to those survivors in that nine seconds very easily. 
Uh, if you ran this, I would say run it in place of corrupt. Again, we talked about corrupt stopping generator progress early, but with lethal pursuer, you're not gonna be so much worried about survivors on gens quickly. If you can find a survivor almost immediately and get them potentially injured almost immediately, this would be a very good perk to potentially run in place of corrupt. So I encourage you to experiment. There are definitely other builds you can run with Wraith and other perks you can run. Those are the perks that I would run or that I would recommend as you start playing Wraith. Let's take a very quick look at his add-ons. Uh, the add-ons we have on currently, uh, Windstorm Blood, which increases his movement speed and cloak by 9%. It's a very rare purple. It is his best add-on for movement speed. And we have the Bone Clapper. The Bone Clapper means that survivors will no longer be able to tell the distance or direction of his Wailing Bell. So what add-ons would you run if you're not running these? Well, a bell add-on is almost always in my repertoire. Almost always. Uh, the other strong add-on for his bell is the coxcomb clapper. That's his ultra rare. This one makes the wailing bell completely silent. So survivors, whenever you ring that bell, as we talked about earlier, uh, it can be heard up to 24 meters away and you hear the whoosh sound up to 40 meters. The bone clapper, means that no longer are survivors going to be able to tell that distance or direction. They're simply going to hear the wailing bell. They're not going to know if you are literally right around the corner from them or if you're halfway across the map. So they're not going to be able to use those directional cues or distance cues any longer to figure out where you're at. And of course, the coxcomb clapper, by making it completely silent, means that as a wraith, you can sneak up on somebody and get your uncloak in before the survivor has any idea you're even there. The only problem with the coxcomb clapper is that once you've used it and once the survivor realizes you have it, they're just going to be a little bit more wary. But again, this is arguably his most powerful add-on. And the bone clapper, even though it's not his most powerful, it's one of his most powerful. Now, as far as his other ra ultra rares, we talked about his movement speed. He, the Wraith has another ultra rare, or I'm sorry, another very rare add-on that is very powerful. This one was recently nerfed, but it's still very useful. The all-seeing blood add-on means that whenever you are cloaked, you will be able to see the ores of survivors when they are eight meters and closer to you. This, coupled with the silent bell, can be a very, very powerful add-on. A lot of times with this particular build, with Make Your Choice, I will run the All-Seeing Blood add-on for no other reason that survivors that are exposed, well, their first instinct is going to be to hide. And while lockers will still keep you from seeing somebody, so if they jump in a locker, you're not going to be able to see them with this add-on. Any survivor who runs behind a wall or into some brush or into the corner of the map to try to get, get away from you if you're running Make Your Choice and they're exposed, well, this is going to help you to be able to find those hiding survivors. But even if you're not playing Make Your Choice, this is a very, very powerful add-on. Um, other add-ons that I run or that I would recommend, any of the movement speed add-ons. Like I said, Windstorm Blood is the one that increases it by 9%, but Windstorm White, which is the rare, the green one, increases his movement speed by 7%. And if you look at his yellow add-ons, Windstorm Mud, the uncommon yellow, will increase his movement speed by 5%. All three of those are very, very powerful add-ons. Uh, other things you can do with your rares in particular, Swift Hunt will increase your uncloaking speed by 12%. Shadow Dance will increase the speed that you vault windows, break pallets or walls, and damage generators by 60% whenever you're cloaked. And these add-ons actually have other comparable add-ons. As you can see, the Shadow Dance White is your vaulting windows, pallets, and walls, and damaging generators only by 40%. And I do believe, no, there's not a yellow one for that, but you do have green add-ons that match up well, not quite as high a percentage Again, we have the Swift Hunt White increases your uncloaking speed, this by 10%. These are also good add-ons. Feel free to, to mix and match with these add-ons and find a combination that you like to play with and that fits your play style. And just really quick to talk about his other add-on, the All-Seeing Spirit, whenever you're cloaked, you'll be able to tell 
the repair progress of any generator by the intensity of their auras. If you were running a perk like Pop instead of Scourge Hook, you could run All Seeing Spirit to know what generator to go to Pop. Uh, this is nowhere near as good as the add-ons we've discussed already. I rarely run it, but again, it's worth mentioning since it is his ultra rare. But my recommendation is that whenever you play, uh, again, the Bone Clapper is an uncommon. You should get plenty of these in your blood web. This is usually pretty good to confuse survivors. Using that with something else is usually a, a, a good idea that if you move some, use something that increases his movement speed, those, like I said, are his best. But any of the other add-ons will do. Again, feel free to experiment with anything you'd like to come up with something that fits whatever play style you want to play with. So, with that being said, we're going to take a look. We talked about positioning. We talked about using that positioning to surprise survivors. And we're going to do this. And our friend Socrates, Jeff, is going to join us here. And we are going to ready up and move into a lobby. And we're going to talk about how to use some of these things to your advantage. And we're also going to show a technique that Wraith players know how to use. It's going to take some practice. I myself am not perfect at doing it. But really, really good Wraith players. The more you play Wraith, the more you practice. It's a very strong technique to use. Jeff, say hello to everybody. Hello. There's Jeff. So Jeff will be our, our, our survivor bait for this round to give us uh, an example to show a couple different things as far as how to, how to use your, your stealthiness to surprise survivors to show you what you don't want to necessarily do. And plus, it's gonna we're going illustrate, to um, illustrate a couple of these techniques we talked about. So we're going to be going to a very, <coughs> excuse me, a very survivor-friendly map in Ormond. And Ormond actually has a very powerful main building. And hopefully that gen won't be blocked. I guess it depends where, we, where, where the game spawns me at, Jeff. Watch, it's going to spawn me in the main building. That would be kind of funny. All right, it did not spawn me in the main building. Let's see what Jen's got blocked. So we spawned in the corner of the map. So if you're running my build, eh, Jen in the main building's blocked. All right, we're going to go look around for Jeff. My assumption is that Jeff is going to be working, that he has spawned somewhere on a Jen that is not that is, that is currently blocked by Corrupt. Now, if you notice, I'm moving along the outside of the map. And the reason I'm doing this is, is that survivors are going to be on the lookout from where you might be coming from. And being able to use high structures to hide your movement is something that is beneficial. So you don't want to necessarily be in the wide open like, We'll take a look, and we're just going to move here until Corrupt wears off. As you can see, as we're moving here, we're going to try to use some of these wall structures to block our approach. So we kind of saw where Jeff was headed at. But what you don't want to do is, you don't want to be moving right out here in the wide open. The reason is, if we're doing this, like... Right here, this is right in the wide open. You can see there's nothing here blocking line of sight. And as we mentioned, the wraith, if I stay still, I'll stay invisible. But if I'm moving, if I am moving, survivors that are within 20 meters are going to be able to see me. They'll still be able to see my shimmer moving around the map. So if you're moving and trying to get, like let's say there was somebody on that generator right there. If I'm moving this way, a survivor would have a clear sight at me coming to get them on the gen. But, on the other hand, if I'm approaching that generator and I suspect survivors are there, at this distance, I'm going to be completely invisible. So what I would want to do is I'd want to approach that generator maybe from a different angle that they wouldn't be expecting. Maybe from around the outside, using this building to block line of sight, and getting close so this way they wouldn't have a chance to be able to get to work on anything 
or if they are working, I'll be able to surprise them and get close to them in order to land a hit before they know I'm there. So on Ormon, we would assume that, uh, again, assuming that Corrupt was not on that main gen, assuming that we had not found somebody by this point, let's just assume we've already chased somebody, we've already downed them. Where would Jeff be likely to be? My guess is Jeff would be headed for the main building at this point. So let's say Jeff, we are guessing, we've just, let's say we've hooked somebody over here on this hook and we decide we want to check on that generator in the main building. Now, there are two ways we could approach this. There are multiple entrances to the main building, but we want to stay as hidden as possible. So we're going to use the building here, and we could tell he is working on it. So we are going to use the wall and start uncloaking like so. All right. Ah, Jeff, you can heal up while I kick this generator. So what did we do there? This is what you don't want to do. You don't want to approach the gen and then start uncloaking, because as you can see, the uncloak is going to take a few seconds to do. As we said before, your uncloaking takes three seconds. So if you start uncloaking, if you start uncloaking literally right here in front of the gen, the survivors will see it. So you want to do things like using the wall, using line of sight blockers to uncloak and then come in and attack, because like in that particular instance, we did not give Jeff very much time at all to react. Uh, even if he was running spine chill, he may have known someone was coming, but he didn't know what angle was we were coming from. And again, as you can see, this would be an angle we wouldn't want to take, because if we did, he would be able to see us coming if he was looking behind him. So, another thing you can do is Ray. So th that's arguably the most important thing you can do is when you try to get your initial attack in, try to use as many line of sight blockers, tall walls, building structures to hide your approach. Something else you can do is as Wraith, when you're cloaked, you can block pallets. So Jeff is gonna try Jeff is gonna try to run down here to this pallet. But here's the thing, we're gonna get in front of him and he can't drop the pallet. Now he can. Whenever you're cloaked, you have you have a collision. So a survivor is not going to be able, a survivor is not going to be able to drop a pallet on you if you are cloaked and you're blocking it. Now, if you are not in the right position, and we're going to try to get in the wrong position, Jeff, come drop this pallet on me. You should be able to from this point if you come from that outside. Where'd you go? I'm still inside. Yeah, see if you, so if you're not in the right position, if you're not in the right position, they will be able to drop a pallet, and if they do that, you will actually uncloak and you'll have to eat a stun. So that's not very easy to do necessarily, but it will take a little bit of time in order to do that, is to block pallets and windows successfully. As you can see, he tries to run up the stairs, I can block the stairs from him and keep him, well, yeah. We can block the stairs and try to keep in position where we want to until we can uncloak and then use that lunge to hit him. Uh, the other thing you can block is not only pallets, but windows as well. So let's say he was headed for this particular window. Again, he could run for this window by the bar if he wanted to, but at the same time, if you position yourself correctly, you could block this window and he's just not going to be able to vault that window and he's going to have to look for another he's going to have to look for another avenue at that point or he could just vault the window or he could just vault the window back after we do it but that does illustrate how you can block pallets and you can block windows whenever you are cloaked finally the last thing that we want to illustrate and we'll have to find a pallet here in the open yeah there's one right outside here as soon as Jeff feels up is you will have survivors that will camp pallets. So let's say I've been chasing Jeff. Uh, let's say, let me uncloak first, Jeff. So uh, let's say I've been chasing you. This is, by the way, this is a terribly unsafe loop. But just start running around the loop, Jeff. Let's say I'm running around this loop and I'm trying to catch him and Jeff's not dropping the pallet. So let's say he stops. I can cloak and at this point, 
he's camping the pallet. Now, Jeff, don't move. We can see he is camping the pallet. So he's waiting at this point. You can make a nice 50-50 guess, but that lunge we were talking about means that we can still land a hit because that lunge is so quick that a lot of times a survivor, not all survivors, some survivors are going to be quick enough to be able to some survivors are going to be quick enough to be able to get that pallet down on you. So it's not going to be 100% of the time. A lot of times, survivors that are at pallets like that, you can go ahead and get cheeky hits on them. Uh, one other thing you can do is you start ringing the bell. Like What we'll do with Jeff on here, now Jeff is not running dead hard, I presume, because Jeff never runs dead hard, right? Jeff, you don't have dead hard on, I'm assuming, correct? I'll never know. So one thing you can do is, as Jeff will start to run is like, let's say you're facing a survivor. One of the things that you absolutely have to do is bait out dead hard is you can ring your bell like this without uncloaking and just kind of like in this case, ah, we block. So we blocked the pallet. So what you can do is you can start ringing your bell in order to bait a survivor. A lot of times a survivor that's looking back will hear you start to ring that bell and they will go ahead and start to uncloak. Actually, let me drop you first here. They will uncloak or uncloak. They will use their dead hard thinking you're uncloaking even though you're not actually doing so. Sometimes you can bait out their dead hard and then uncloak for real. As we said, if we're cloaked, you have survivors, you can't do anything, but again, you can interact with the environment like kicking walls or generators, but you can't pick people up. You will have to uncloak to do that, and of course, you're gonna wanna watch out for flashlights in particular. Jeff, let me go bring you the hatch. I heard it, I think, on the way over here, and we will get out of this match. But those are some of the... Actually, where did we hear hatch? Thought we heard it over here. Was it by the killer shack? It, I knew it was in one of these corners. So hopefully some of these uh, some of these techniques will be of help if you learn to play Wraith or if you're just starting to pick up Wraith. Again, a biggest most most important thing I can think of is to use your invisibility wisely. You don't want survivors to get too much notice that you're coming. And again, once they know that you're a wraith, they're going to be looking out for you. They're going to be watching out for, for you to be cloaked. They're going to be looking to, to be surprised. They're going to be a lot more careful and a lot more wary. And the best way to counteract that is to go ahead and try to use your stealth to its best advantage. And the best way to do that is to use, like I said, line of sight blockers in order to keep survivors from seeing you approaching until it's absolutely too late for them to get anywhere safe. You want to catch survivors out in the open as race. The last thing you want to do is find yourself continuously uncloaking and then having to chase survivors around a loop forever because the current meta with survivors is to basically hold W to run from tile to tile and drop pallets. And one way to counter the wraith is just to get some distance on him. It's gonna take him that time to uncloak, and while he's uncloaking, if you can get to a window, if you can get to a pallet, drop a pallet, put some distance between you and the wraith, he's gonna have to cloak up again to make up that distance, or he's just gonna have to chase you down as a regular 4.6 killer, and in both of those instances, you're gonna be able to buy your team some time. The best way to counter that if you're playing the wraith is to make sure they don't get that warning and that you give a survivor as little notice as possible before you attack. The silent bell can help with that. The aura reading can help with that add-on. The bone clapper bell add-on can help with that. But even if you're not running those, just using your environment to help you to get that surprise on your survivors, that alone can be enough to help turn the tide and help make you a successful wraith whenever you play your matches. So. Anybody who has any questions for Wraith play, I'm certain there's plenty of things that I did not mention or forgot to go over. But again, this is a very, very basic beginner's guide to playing Wraith. Hopefully this will be helpful. Again, I recommend if you haven't played Wraith before, check him out. He's a lot of fun to play. 
Uh, survivors, for the most part, actually don't mind playing against a lot of race, I guess. I don't, at least. I, I mean, maybe some do, but I, I enjoy playing Wraith. He's fun. He's He doesn't really require a ridiculous amount of strategy or thinking. His power is very easy to learn how to use. And if you're looking to branch out on your killer some, I definitely recommend to give him a try. I think you'll have a lot of fun with him. Hopefully this guide was helpful to you. Again, feel free to comment below with any questions or any comments on anything that you saw during the video. And in the meantime, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button as well. We have new videos that go up on the channel on a daily basis. And you can follow us at the link below at Geriatric Gaming 11 and get notified whenever we go live there with killer rounds or survive with friend rounds with my friend Jeff here. Until our next time, thanks again so much for watching. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. We'll see you in the next Dead by Daylight.